Hello there, welcome to this video and today I'm going to be, to be going through and ranking the top 36 biggest selling jazz albums of all time. You know, so rather than ranking, you know, I'll be, I'm going to be ranking them, so I'm going to be looking at the actual quality and what I think in terms of their artistic worth. You know, but uh, in terms of um, commerciality in jazz, you know, I, I think this is something that gets not discussed enough when people look at jazz history. They don't realise that the forms that exist and the artists that are there, they're there because they sold records. You know, the ones who didn't sell records aren't there. You know, the movements that didn't sell anything aren't there. You know, they all sold. You're probably thinking, free jazz, that never sold any records, did it? Well, we'll see, we'll see. Um, so, um, where have I got this list from? Well, it's actually, if you go on the net and try and find a list of big selling uh, jazz albums, it's really hard to find. There's one guy that's done it, and it's on um, rate your, rateourmusic.com. So if you go over to rateourmusic.com, uh, there is a list by a guy called Refugium, and it's called the best selling jazz albums of all time, or there's no money in jazz. That's the name of it. So if you Google that, you'll find it, you'll find the list. Right, now what's really interesting, when I read this, he's put a little note up Refugium has, and he says, here is a list of the highest selling jazz and jazz fusion albums based on RIAA info. This list is meant to be informative only, again, based on record sales and not the opinion of myself or any individual, individual I know. This is not necessarily a best of, right? Although I did find myself pleasantly surprised by some of these entries. I did too, you know. Um, he then goes on to say, that here it goes, note two. You may notice the absence of cheese jazz like Dinah Krall and Kenny G. Oh, well, let's just focus on the real stuff and call it a day. Kenny G and Di Dinah Krall are jazz musicians. This is something that's really weird that I find happens as soon as you get with the, you know, jazz fans, you know. Kenny G has sold 65 million albums. Dinah Krall has sold 15 million albums. If you included them, they'd be on the top of this list, you know, in, in terms of sales. Uh, they make jazz. Now, it's really weird. If we had a top blues albums of all time, I'm sure Robert Cray would be there. I'm sure even Gary Moore still plays the blues albums will be there. How much that's got to do with Robert Johnson and T-Bone Walker, I don't know, you know, but they would be there. But it's funny um, with this, this, that they're, it's that this guy's it's chosen to ignore those artists, you know. Uh, so uh, that elitism in jazz is always there to some level. The other thing that's interesting is... Um, I know that albums like The Colm Concert by Keith Jarrett has sold over a million copies. I know that Friday Night in San Francisco uh, by um, John McGoffin, I don't think that's in there, uh, by John McGoffin, the album of Pacto I don't think that's in there, I can't quite remember. So I think there's a few omissions, but it seems pretty accurate to me. Um, and however we look at it, these are big selling uh, jazz albums. So let's start right down at number 36. What's at number 36 in the jazz charts? Well, number 36, we have My Favourite Things by John Coltrane. How do I rate this album? It's up there as one of the greatest jazz albums of all time. It is one of the most in innovative albums of all time. Um, the modal ideas that um, had emerged in the 1950s, Coltrane takes to another place on this album. It's really, really important. Um, and the way he plays modally is an advancement. And the fact that he transforms a tune like My Favourite Things into this great big modal epic, that transformative um, approach that he takes on that album, I think was not only influential on things like... Um, minimalism, Philip Glass, Steve Reich, but it was also influence, influential on hip hop because he basically takes a section of it and loops it and plays over that. That's what happens. So this is a really, really important album. It's sold over half a million copies. That's an incredible amount of records. And it's, it's, it's veering on a free jazz album. So there is something that's approaching free jazz in this chart. Uh, at number five, we have another John Coltrane album, Giant Steps. Again, one of the most important albums in history. You know, uh, why? Because of the track Giant Steps, where Coltrane tried to free music by harmonically just busting out of the very system on which jazz is built, the 251. So influential, and of course, Giant Steps has become the test piece for any jazz musician. You know, 
Are you a jazz musician? Yeah, I'm a jazz musician. Can you play giant steps? Nah. <laughs> Are you really a jazz musician then? You cannot be a jazz musician unless you could play giant steps. Well, it created that as well, you know, uh, which I don't, th don't know whether that's a good thing or not. Um, at number 34, we have Possibilities by Herbie Hancock. Now, I don't know this album, which is, but it's sold over half a million copies. Looking at it, it looks like Herbie Hancock has duetted or um, worked with a number of different guests. So I think a few years ago, um, this became quite the fashion. I think after the Santa, Santana Supernatural album, where you had all those guests on that album, then it went and sold millions and millions. Um, I think a lot of musicians did this, and it looks like Herbie Hancock's done that here. He's um, working alongside John Mayer, Santana, Christine Aguilera, Paul Simon, Annie Lennox, Sting, Josh Stone, Johnny Lang, Damien Rice, Lisa Hannigan, Paul Midon and Trey Anastasio. Of course, Herbie Hancock is one of the biggest selling jazz artists of all time. Then if you combine him with Sting and Christina Aguilera, it's going to sell some records, isn't it? You know, if just a minute part of the each of those fan bases buy this album, it's going to sell some records. I cannot comment on the quality. I've never heard it, but it's Herbie. And Herbie's always amazing, so I'm sure it's of a high level. Um, at number 33, we have an album called What a Wonderful World by Louis Armstrong. Louis Armstrong is the most important musician of the 20th century, right? He didn't invent jazz, but he took jazz and he turned it into an art form, right? What I find absolutely fascinating is that towards the end of his life, right, when you'd had bebop and you'd had cool jazz and west coast jazz and hard bop, when you'd had modal jazz and free jazz and even the beginnings of jazz fusion, that Louis Armstrong was still able to go to the top of the charts. He not only went to the top of the charts with um, What a Wonderful World, but he went to the top of the charts with Hello Dolly. Hello Dolly is an out and out Louis Armstrong tune. He does not compromise at all on that tune. That is what Louis Armstrong does, out and out. But what a wonderful world. That is one of the greatest pop songs of all time, proving that Louis was still, right at the end of his life, still one of the greatest pop singers of all time. What a guy. This is a testament to this person, right? At number 32, we have um, Louis Armstrong, 20th century jazz masters. Again, you know, I'm, I will now skirt over all the Louis Armstrongs. I've said my bit. But overridingly, one of the most important musicians of the 20th century, not because just because of his innovations, but also because of his, his impact on popular music. What a voice. On trumpet and on, the, on, on voice. Okay, at number 31. This, this is interesting. Stanley Jordan, Magic Touch. So just Stanley Jordan emerged in the 1980s. He was actually a busker and he was on the sidewalk in America playing the guitar with two hands. He's sort of taken that Eddie Van Halen, you know, approach where you play, you know, with this hand and then you also play with this hand. But he, he turned the guitar into almost like a piano. It's, it's quite incredible what Stanley Jordan did, you know, um, where it's almost like two independent things happening at the same time. Um, I think it's a testament to um, what Jazz Fusion did in the 70s, that in the 80s there was a structure there where a record company could take a musician like that, you know, uh, and with a, the right marketing, you know, be able to sell in with gold, so it's over a half, half a million copies of an album sold, you know, and put it into 31 in the all-time jazz charts. Again, I think Stanley Jordan is a very creative, innovative musician, if only technically, right? I don't know musically where I'd rate him, but I think in terms of the history of guitar, um, there are so many musicians after, you know, after his time and around now, so many YouTube musicians that are using what he did, but he was the first guy to really do that, you know. He was the first, you know, Instagram musician before Instagram even exists, so let's give him some kudos. Um, I do know the album. I've, I've, I haven't got the album, but I, I've, I've got some of the tracks on compilations and I've heard it many a time. And it's a good album. It's interesting. He does what jazz musicians have always does. He takes, you know, contemporary popular songs and he transforms them using jazz. That's what jazz does. So good on him. 
Uh, number 30, we have Ella Fitzgerald and the best of the songbooks. Right. Um, I grew up with Ella Fitzgerald. It was one of the greatest voices of all time. You know, I think... Um, there's two great female singers in jazz. There's uh, um, Bessie Smith, which is that big, powerful, you know, almost operatic, but blues voice, very powerful. And then there's Billie Holiday, which is a very tiny little voice, but with the phrasing and the way she bends the notes is absolutely magical. Um, and Ella Fitzgerald emerges just a little bit after Billie Holiday, and she sort of combines both. Um, and it's so powerful that she sells millions and millions of records, right? And Ella can go from, you know, the dirtiest, you know, down blue soulful singing to she can scat like a bebop musician and she can sing a popular song. She's something else. Um, in the 1950s, she, you know, um, recorded a series of albums where she would do all Cole Porter songs and all then she would do George Gershwin songs. I have those albums. I grew up with those albums. I know them very, very well. All arranged by Nelson Riddle. They're some of the greatest albums ever. And it's this argument that I've been trying to get across that, yeah, we love all the bebop, we love all the free jazz, we love all the way out jazz, but jazz is also able to make really, really commercial music, right, which is of the highest um, caliber, you know, and that really comes from the swing era. It's the swing era of musicians that showed us how to do that. And Ella Fitzgerald did that in the 1950s. Absolutely incredible high art, but also really accessible to, you know, most normal people. You're right, so Ella at number 30. At number 29, we have Dave Brubeck and Dave Brubeck's greatest hits. Right, so you have the bebop jazzers in the 1940s. Then you have the third stream musicians in the late 40s like Stan Kent and Lenny Tristano, you know, Lee Konitz. And this really influence, influences a post bebop style of music, which is what we could call West Coast jazz, cool jazz. Um, Dave Brubeck was the star of that scene. You know, he, he made his name because he went out touring uh, college campuses and the students loved what he was doing. Right, so. He had a number one hit single, I think, with Take Five. Everybody knows Take Five, but Take Five is a really heavy tune for two reasons. The first is obviously it's, it's in an odd time signature. That's not easy to do. It's hard enough to get a jazz single in the charts, but to get one in 5-4 in the charts, incredible, right? But it's also a modal piece. Right, when Paul Desmond takes that saxophone solo, he plays mode and he plays beautifully modally. It's one of the great modal solos of all time. As pioneering as Kind of Blue, I know it's a few months after Kind of Blue, but it never gets mentioned as a modal piece. And Joe Mario's drumming, it's so featured. I mean, on the I know it's not on the single, but on the um the full version, he does a, a drum solo in the middle of this tune. All these things should not make the record accessible, but it is accessible. And the reason is because of um, Paul Desmond at uh, genius composition and Brubeck's genius arrangement. I think um, the Dave Brubeck group 1950s does not get the credit due. And we know why that is, right? And the reason is, is because it's not a black group, it's a mixed race group, right? Um, Gene Wright, incredible bass player, black bass player. But I do feel that um, there's this idea that um, musicians from outside of the Afro-American community in jazz never get rated as highly, uh, you know, uh, unless you're Django Reinhardt. He's the only one who does, I think. I'm trying to think of anybody where they, where they, they, they are upheld, you know, um, as high. And, and I think that's... That does nobody any favours thinking like that. Brubeck was a really incredible musician. He knew his stuff. He was rooted in jazz and he took the form and he advanced it. He really innov innovated, right? And he sold records at the same time, right? Did he sell records because he was white and there's some racism going on there? Most likely, I, I guess that, that that is something that needs to be addressed, but that should not take away anything from him as an artist, because I think he was absolutely incredible. Big influence on me, you know, growing up, I listened to um, the Brubeck albums and it gave me a love of odd time changes, which has stayed with me for the rest of my life, you know. But yeah, 
a difficult musician to talk about. I will leave it there. We will return to this subject in a later video, I think. Right, number 28. John Coltrane, Blue Train. Right, this is his only album on Blue Note. I think he really benefits from their production values. I think some of the Coltrane albums on Prestige and Atlantic aren't quite as well recorded as this album. Um, it's, 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 it's one of Coltrane's great albums and there's some really great playing on there. Um, Moments Notice is the sort of demo uh, for uh, Giant Steps. So a really great album. Um, so far on this list, I would have put all these albums as being really fantastic artistically as well as being big sellers. And at number 27, not John Coltrane, A Love Supreme. That album, that's a free jazz album. I don't care what anyone says, that's a free jazz album. Right, and here it is, you know, um, it says it's gold, so it's over um, half a million copies. I would imagine it's close to have sold, selling a million copies. Um, it's probably in my top three albums of all time, one of the greatest albums ever made. Uh, what can we say about A Love Supreme? Um, really influential on jazz and jazz fusion, really influential on music as a whole, really influential on jazz as a whole. It's a groundbreaking album. Uh, but one of the things that I think Love, uh, Love Supreme does is it brings spirituality as a central theme, not only into jazz, but into music. And of course, spirituality is going to be a very important thing in the 1960s. And it's going to be around the hippie era. It's going to be around psychedelic ideas and all that type of thing. So it's going to be really, really important. And what's interesting to me is one of the biggest selling jazz fusion artists, which is the Mavish Orchestra, which makes very, very difficult music. I think we're able to do that because of the spiritual element that was attached to it. And that really comes directly from this, you know, incredible album at number 27 i love supreme right at number 26 louis armstrong all-time greatest hits there he is again he dominates this chart louis does amazing that the the one of the, the the most important early jazz artists dominates this all the way through that's a testament to louis would there even be an art form if he, if he hadn't have been around i sometimes wonder right number 25 Pat Metheny group, A Letter From Home. Pat Metheny, in terms of sales, as we'll see, dominates the 80s jazz scene. He's, he's one of the biggest selling artists of the 80s. Um, and these are fantastic albums. And they do everything that jazz does. You know, a Pat Metheny, he's a sort of Wes Montgomery style, Jim Hall style player. You know, he's listened to the Beatles as much as he listened to Wes Montgomery. And he's open and he just pulls everything in. You can hear everything on a Pat Metheny album, right? Um, are they jazz albums? Of course they are because the improvisation and the swing and the, and, 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 and the use of the personal voice, these are the things that really make jazz what they are. But uh, it's a fantastic album, one of his great albums. Um, and it's there at number 25. Number 24, Benny Government Goodman, live at Carnegie Hall. Right, so um, as I said before in other videos, jazz was the dominant popular music form in the 1930s. The swing era was, was um, the era where jazz combined instrumental virtuosity um, with um, an accessibility and popular music sort of approach, which, you know, through swing and melody caught the ears of the people and I think um, with the swing era you have music of an incredibly high um, caliber but selling a lot of records of course they weren't selling albums they were selling sort of 78 singles back in the 1930s which uh, means they don't get seen on this chart this chart does not really show you how much you know somebody like Glenn Miller actually sold but um, Ben, Benny Goodman's Carnegie Hall concert is sort of legendary in the history of jazz and it's there at number 24 so that's that's the echo I think in this chart it's the echo of the full power of um, jazz in the 1930s of the swing year um, Benny Goodman of course here we have it again you know this Benny Goodman Artie Shaw, the Dorsey Brothers, they were the white version of swing, you know, that was accessible uh, uh, to a sort of racist American 
listing public, right? And then behind them you have your Count Basies and your Duke Ellingtons and your Chick Webbs, which, you know, could be argued were the innovators and the real where the real art is. Um, and I think that's fair to say. This is something that does happen in, in jazz. Um, but Benny Goodman um, was an incredible soloist, right? And Benny Goodman was one of the first artists to bring black musicians into his group, most notably Lionel Hampton, and I would say, most importantly, Charlie Christian. I really start to think that Charlie Christian is one of the, the most important musicians that ever lived, right? Uh, because he not only is one of the guys that creates bebop. I read the other day that the word bebop as a description of the phrasing of bebop came from Charlie Christian trying to describe what he was doing. But he's also such an incredible soloist, not just a, a good soloist on guitar. He's one of the greatest soloists has ever lived. His free flowing ideas, absolutely incredible. Um, and of course he really in, uh, creates electric guitar playing so his influence on rock music is unfathomable and I think uh, if I'm going to give Benny Goodman any accolades it's for discovering Charlie Christian and, and pushing him to the fore because without him doing that they would rock and roll and rock music would look a lot different believe me right so um, at 23 we have a secret story by Pat Metheny there he is again um, there's a run of albums he makes in the in the late 80s where he's at the peak of his commercial power and that's one of those albums, they're all in there. Um, it's not the best one, but it's a brilliant album. I think the best one will be his, his biggest sell albums. We're going to see that in a bit. Right, number 22. Here he is, Winton Marsalis. And number 22, Hot House Flowers. Right, I have Hot House Flowers. I've got it back there. So many people bought that album. That even I've got it, right? And it's a good album. Um, it's it it's it's setting Winton's trumpets in a sort of orchestral setting, a little bit like the Ella Fitzgerald albums in the 1950s. They tried to do that there. It's very commercial. It's a record company taking Winton early in his career and and really putting the full force and getting a, you know a hit record out of him. Now I'm going to talk about Winton in my next video where I look at 1980s jazz. So um, I think Winter Masalis is an incredibly technically gifted trumpet player. You know, I think he is, um, his skill as a jazz musician cannot be underestimated. He's a really great trumpet player. I don't believe he's an innovative trumpet player, right? I think um, commercially, because he was a, um, a jazz musician that could also play classical music. I think that was really newsworthy. Oh my God, he's so good. He could actually play classical music. You know, that idea, um, which is a pretty <laughs> rotten idea, I think, uh, helped propel him into the public eye. Okay. Um, but he was not an innovator. And so he's pushing of sort of jazz as a tradition that we that should be respected i think um did jazz no favors but you're going to get a lot more about that in the next video but there he is very important musician you know i i would say winter messiahs and pat Metheny are the two um dominant voices in 1980s jazz and he's at number 22 in the charts uh, and he's also at number 21, Winter Masalis, Masalis Standard Time, Volume 1. Winter Masalis plays jazz standards, right? And there he is on the front, you know, he's got his black tuxedo, little black bow tie, a white shirt. You know, this is the record company really selling the idea of jazz. You know, in the safest form it can possibly be in, right? No, no feathers will be ruffled on this album, I'm sure it says on the back if you look at it. Um, Number 20, there's an, uh, and number 20 and number 19, there's um, an album called Jazz Masters, volumes one and two. Volume one sold the, the most. I looked up these albums because I don't know it, and it's full of swing era artists like Ben Webster, Colman Hawkins, all that type of stuff. And I think, again, it's that echo of uh, the success that um, 
jazz had in the 1930s and the power of that to even years later to sell albums. Um, I think for most mainstream people, that is what they think of as jazz. You know, Lester Young, Carmen Hawkins, they don't know those artists, but I think when they hear that, that's what they think of as jazz. And I think for many people who don't listen to jazz, there's attraction to that music to this day. And I think it's born out with those albums. Right, at number 18, Miles Davis, Sketches of Spain. All right, Miles Davis invented fusion, didn't he, with In a Silent Way and Bitches Brilliant. Well, he, not maybe not, but he's fusing music on Sketches of Spain. He brings that Spanish influence in to jazz. Now, of course, that Spanish tinge, as Jelly Roll Morton described it, is there right from the beginning of jazz with the Creole musicians in New Orleans are bringing in that Spanish influence the whole time. Spanish music is always there with jazz. I think what Miles did on this album was really codified it and, and made it concrete. And I think a lot of the fusion musicians were really influenced by this album. It is a really, really great album. And it's a testament to Miles's um, voice. Miles's tone sells records, okay? His tone sells records, that lonely, right um delicate sound which is almost like uh, vulnerable but in a persona which is so hard and streetwise those two things together mix in a way which is absolutely profound and compelling and i think that's why miles sells records so he can play anything right it his it, it, sound is so sweet that he can play the most avant-garde music, right? But you're still going to be able to lock onto that sweet sound. But he can also take the most sort of schlocky Disney tune, like Someday My Prince Will Come, and that loneliness will turn it into something else. And suddenly the uh, lyric Someday My Prince Will Come in that lonely, vulnerable context it changes the the nature of what that song means you know um jazz has always been about transformation moles is one of the great magicians he really can transform music and he does it here on sketch of spain one of the greatest albums ever made right number 17 pat Metheny, still live talking right i've got um a video out there if you want to see me talk about pat Metheny's albums but I think in his commercial run of albums, he makes uh, these three albums in the, in the late 80s. Secret Story, Let's From Home and this one. I think this is the greatest one, absolutely incredible album. Uh, there's some soloing on there. It's Pat's the best, the orchestration's incredible. Pat doesn't pull any punches. You know, this is a, a big selling album, but it's a, it's a very, very creative, you know, uh, creative album, which has got a lot, a lot of artistic merit for it to it right number 16 love and love devotion and surrender by carla santana and mavish new john mcgoughlin right john mcgoughlin in his mavish new period um in his um uh devotion to sri chimnoy period this is intense music it's off the scale Right, and here we have it at number 16 in the Jazz Tarts, biggest selling jazz albums of all time. It's a difficult album. Even me being a McGoughlin fan has always found side two, Let Us Go Into the House of the Lord or whatever it's called. That track is so intense, it's a bit much even for me. Right, it's, it's full on. Um, John McGoughlin uh, and Carlos at this time, you know, Carlos Santana, you know, they haven't classed his albums, but I'm sure if you could stick in, you know, Caravanserai or Lotus, those albums should be in those charts, but there's this division where you're going, those, those fusion albums that Santana made, they're not jazz, but this is, this is nonsense, you know. Um, they were selling spirituality to a post-hippie audience that were open to having their minds, minds blown. And God, this album does blow your mind. It's a heavy album. Um, I think it's a little bit patchy. It would not be in my top 10 John McGoughlin albums. It's a little bit patchy. Um, I think The Life Divine, though, is one of his greatest moments ever. It's an incredible track, and it's up with any Mavish New orchestra, orchestra track, which, if you watch this channel, you will know is my favourite band of all time, and that's the way it is. So um, 
I am chuffed at number 15 to tell you that the album at, sitting at number 15 is Birds of Fire by the Mavish Nuxtra. All right. Does this not blow out of the window, this idea that jazz fusion came along right, and destroyed the artistic merit of jazz, you know, that it got polluted, that jazz should be protected from it. We're not going to include this in, in the discussion. You know, anyone who's watched the Ken Burns, you know, view of jazz, when they get to the 1970s, they just sidestep it. You know, oh, some musicians started, you know, uh, um, bringing in rock and pop influences into jazz. And that went down another channel, which we're not going to talk about, because it's not real jazz. Here's the real jazz. You know, four guys with suits on, standing up against a microphone, playing, you know, post-bebop sound in music. And that's the way it should stay for the rest of time, right? That is the idea that you get in the mainstream history of jazz, okay? I, I can remember watching an interview with Winter Marsalis when he first emerged in the early 80s and he said well you know fusion's okay but it's very just easy listening music you know uh, you know I'm playing real jazz go and listen to Birds of Fire by the Mavic Orchestra try and play it what John McGoughlin did with that band is incredible he went out and played night after night to thousands and thousands, sometimes tens of thousands of people and sold tickets and got in the charts with not only instrumental music, but and not only instrumental music in 1916, but instrumental music in 1916, which took everything in and sucked it into a black hole. You know, it takes jazz, psychedelic, rock, prog, Indian music, folk music, classical music, and he just pulls it in and throws it right out in your face with some of the most intense music. This, I think, instrumentally or compositionally, is the high point of rock music. Rock music never went further out than this, ever. Not Napalm Death, not, not you know, um, Square Pusher, right? None of those really got to the, to the point where this was, you know, um, because this band would go out and play for two and a half hours. You know, these tracks became like half an hour long. You know, people were crying. They were too upset. This is the loudest band in the world. This is the peak of rock music. It's the ideas in the 60s taken to their zenith, right? You can't go further out than the Mavish Nuxtra. Um, but somehow he sold a ton of records doing it. And here we have, right? Uh, Mavish Nuxtra Birds of Fire number 15, this made the, um, I think it made the top 20 rock pop charts in America. It's an incredible achievement for an album which is really difficult and an album, of course, that changed my life. But selling even more than that is Romantic Warrior by Return to Forever. I found this really surprising that that's in there. You know, uh, I didn't know that Return to Forever had sold more than the Mavish Nuxtra. Um, this album is really jazz fusion meeting prog. Um, it's one of my favourite albums and I absolutely love it. The playing's incredible um, and its production is absolutely brilliant. Ken Scott's wonderful production on there, but it is a little bit schlocky. It is a little bit tongue-in-cheek. I think Chick Corea knew that when he made it. You know, there's, there's certain points where you can almost hear sort of comedy music creeping in as Chick sort of just um, lets you know that he's in on the joke as well. But it's one of the great albums, you know, and there's some absolutely beautiful moments in there. Is it creatively on the same level as a Mavish Nuxtra? I don't think it is, it's not quite there. But it's an incredible album to have in, in um, the top 30 or so jazz albums of all time, incredible. Um, at number 13, we have a single. It's the only single, the only jazz single, I think, that's made the chart. And it's Rocket by Herbie Hancock. <laughs> Even I would be hard pressed to uh, call this a, a jazz track. It's influenced by jazz hugely, right? Herbie Hancock does um, do a little solo on it. I can tell you how the solo goes. It goes... Bang. 
That's how it does. I think that's it. And then he goes back to comping. There's hardly any improvisation on this album, on this track. Um, Rocket's influence on popular music is absolutely huge. But it must be mentioned, of course, that the track was created by the great Bill Laswell. And if you want to know more about that, check out my um, video on Bill Laswell. And there's a ton of information about him and this this track so but incredible it's number 13 and number 12 Aldi Miola with Elegant Gypsy so according to this Elegant Gypsy sold more than Return to Forever and it sold more than um the Mavish Nuxtra. um I love that album one of the great fusion albums it's not some middle of the road Fusak album it's it's a heavy hitting album which really you know did stuff which laid the groundwork for stuff that was going to happen in heavy metal, you know, in the 1980s, and it's, it's, it's influences there to this day on guitar players. Um, again, I've done a, a video about it, if you want to check out that. Um, all the fusion albums that we've covered, there's there's none, none of that sort of middle of the road Fusak thing is in here. These are all really seriously heavy albums. Right, number 11 is an album that I actually don't know very well. It's by Jean-Pierre Rampal and Claude Bolling, and it's called Sweet for Flute and Jazz Piano. And I think it's in the um, tradition of like Jack, Jack Lucia, where you sort of classical e-fi jazz, which I, I find very interesting. Uh, the artistic merits of that, I think it's that snobby thing coming in. It's always been there, you know, all jazz musicians, some of them are so good, they could even play classical music. There's that idea, you know. Um, there's so many jazz musicians that can play classical music and some of them can do it really, really well. Winter Bissolis being one, Keith Jarrett being another, right? The amount of classical musicians that can play jazz is very, very small, right? If non-existent, I'm, I, can't, I'm, I can't think of one that's ever been able to do that. Nigel Kennedy, I think... Nigel Kennedy's a jazz musician as much as he is a classical musician. Once you can play it, you're in the club. That's the thing with jazz. If any classical musician comes over and can play it, they're in the jazz club. It's, it's, not, a, it's not a snobby club in itself. It's snobby in the way it gets perceived by people on the outside. Um, but I don't know that, that album. It's got an absolutely fantastic cover uh, with the piano and the flutes in bed. Uh, together and they're enjoying a cigarette. God knows what they've just done, but uh, that's what is there. 1975, um, I will need to check it out, but I'm sure with you knowledgeable people out there who watch this channel, you'll be able to tell me all about that album and tell me how great it is. Right, so, number 10, Stan Getz, yeah, Gilberto featuring Antonio Carlos Jobin, Getz Gilberto. Right, I haven't talked about this on this channel, Right, but in the early 60s, it's, I feel like it's, it's like a, a preamble to fusion, right? Jazz musicians suddenly got in the charts, and they got in the charts by playing bossa nova stuff, and uh, Stan Getz was the guy that did that. And that music was a, a, was a, a, a taken the bebop ideas, West Coast jazz, and found a way of really making them commercial by aligning them up with a really danceable beat. Right, this happens over and over again. That's this is this is something that you should not look down upon. You know, jazz invents swing. Right, swing that thing of the pulse that makes people want to dance. It's in jazz. You can put a disco beat on a Charlie Parker record. You can put a disco beat on 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 Kind of Blue by Miles Davis. You can even put it on some of the Coltrane stuff like Giant Steps. <laughs> it swings, right? Everything swings in jazz. Right, so this is what makes the form great. We shouldn't be diminishing these things because we think we're above them intellectually. And uh, those that bossa nova style was very, very influential. And I think Antonio Carlos Jobim was such a great composer. So many jazz standards were written by him. And I think the way, the sophistication of his chord forms has been very, very, very influential. I learnt harmony, really, by trying to learn Antonio Carlos Jobin tunes, you know, and having to get my, my head around all those minor two, five, ones. So absolutely great album. And that's at number 10, so we're in the top 10. Number nine, here we have Louis Armstrong, Hello Dolly. You know, 
as I said before, he went to number one in the charts with Hello Dolly, which is a straight out and out New Orleans jazz tune. You know, lyrics, the tune, the way he sings it, the way they play, the way he takes the solos. It's just pure Louis. So it sh shows that whatever jazz musicians created in the 1910s, 1920s was so unique and accessible to so many people around the world that he could still get a number one 30 or 40 years later in the 1960s with that sound. Isn't amazing? At number eight, right, with over a million cells, everything I'm going to go through now is sold over a million copies. We have Miles Davis' Bitches Brew, right? I would say, for a long time I said that Bitches Brew was my favourite album. I think it's been eclipsed by Visions of the Emerald Beyond by the Mavish Dorkshire. That's become my favourite album. But Bitches Brew is, is in my top three albums. Uh, which would probably be that Mavish Dorkshire album, this album, and The Love Supreme. Um, when I bought Bitches Brew, I bought it because of the lineup. I looked and it was like John McGoughlin's on there, Chick Corea's on there, Joe Sawinall's on there, Wayne Shorter's on there, uh, Lenny White's on there. You know, I just couldn't believe the lineup, so I bought it. And when I got got it home, I, uh, I I I didn't like it. It was just too much. It was too extreme and out there. It just sounded like loads of musicians screaming over one over one over over one. I can't even say it. Um, sounds like musicians just screaming at each other. It was chaotic. You know, it was it was dark and writhing. You know, and the tracks were like half an hour long, and you know. I could hear Miles Davis talking on it. He, they didn't seem to know what they were doing. All these things. I just didn't get it. But because of the people on the album, every night I put the headphones on and listened to it. And then one night I got it and it changed my life. This is the album that opened me up to avant-garde jazz. was Bitches Brew. This is a difficult album. Why did it sell a million albums? Well, because at the time, culturally... He had bands like Jefferson Airplane. He had bands like The Grateful Dead. Um, hippies were taking drugs and trying to tune in and drop out, you know. And I think this album comes along in 1970s and just blows your mind. That's why this album sold so many copies. It must have been a challenge to many hippies to go and, you know, get out of their face and put Bitches Brew on. I'm sure that's what did it. I'm sure that's what makes this a success. But it's, it's not just random jazz jamming. It's the greatest musicians in jazz under the direction of one of the visionaries of jazz trying to create new forms of music, which they do. Um, the fallout from this album wasn't felt for years. When I first got into it, um, I, people were still struggling with it. But with the advent of like dance music, electronic, electronica, hip hop, you hear the sound of Bitches Brew all the time now. Um, so, incredible, this is probably the most extreme million selling album there is in history. <laughs> Thanks, Miles. At number seven, we have another album by Louis Armstrong called What a Wonderful World, with, um, which is a compilation album. It sold over a million copies. Louis Armstrong just dominates this chart. At number six, we have a compilation album called Ken Burns Jazz, The Story of America's Music. I'm really going to be looking at the Ken Burns version of jazz history in the next video when I look at 1980s jazz and we get into Winter Masalis. And there's sort of, you know, there's a jazz critic called Stanley Crouch and his sort of view of jazz history. Um, what this is a testament to is how powerful that version is. I love his Ken Burns documentary. I watch it every single year and I find new things in it. It's absolutely incredible, right? But it is just a version of it. There's things I don't think are true. There's viewpoints I don't think are true. The biggest one being the sort of omission of jazz fusion, the omission of artists like Keith Jarrett, like John McGoughlin, like Joe Zawinul, like Chick Corea, like Pat Metheny, you know, some of the most important musicians in the history of jazz just get absolutely ignored in that history. Right. Also, it's very revisionist. 
very revisionist. So jazz becomes this Afro-American art form where the most important inputs came from Afro-American musicians. Um, so every single um, non-Africa Afro-American musician that's covered, we keep getting reminded of the debt to Afro-American Afro music. Yes, that is the case, right? This form was created by Afro-American musicians, but right from day one, musicians of all cultures were involved in the creation of jazz. And the reason is, is because what Afro-American musicians did was cre to create the most inclusive art form in the history of art forms. Anybody, whatever you, wherever you come from, can get involved in this music. You take something like heavy metal. How many black musicians are in heavy metal? They're coming through now, there's few. But that is not an inclusive form for black musicians. You know, um, I think one of the greatest, you know, heavy metal bands of all time was Living Colour. But Living Colour were there making the point that there was no real accessibility for black musicians into heavy metal. You know, how many um, female musicians are there in jazz? You know, how many are there? Well, not that many. They've, even though, as I'm saying, jazz is inclusive. Um, there are barriers in music, okay? But jazz as an art form, the way it's created, anybody can get, that's the whole point of it. You can be a white musician and black, you know, musician, you can be a female musician, but you can walk in and you don't need to know the groundwork. This is what I mean by inclusive. You don't need to know the cliches. If you're going to be a heavy metal musician, you need to know the cliches. You need to know how to play metal. You need to know all that stuff. And that comes from your culture. If your culture has got heavy metal in it, then you'll get it. If you haven't, you'll start from, um, you know, from nothing. But with a jazz musician, jazz musician doesn't need to know tunes they don't need all they need to know is the blues and how to play for the form and they need to know the rules of improvisation but it allows musicians to get together that don't know each other that haven't rehearsed from different cultures you don't need to be able to talk to each other you know i've i've jammed with musicians that i never spoke to i've got up on jam sessions and played uh, and the, and i've and i've i've smiled at them and they've smiled at me we've communicated but never actually spoken because that's what jazz does, you know. Um, it's like I feel that the, the great thing about jazz is its inclusivity. Uh, I don't feel that that really comes across in the Ken Burns documentary. I think it's this idea that jazz is something that should be revered, that should be talked about in hushed tones. This wonderful style of music which uh, should not be polluted by anything that is not jazz that does not rooted in that tradition that's the idea that comes across uh, and i don't think that's a good idea sorry but we will get into that more later on so number five day brew bet quartet time out the actual album that take five is on uh, brilliant album Okay, number four, Future Shock by Herbie Hancock. That's the album that Rocket's on, you know, produced by Bill Laswell, May 1983. Uh, I, I would, even I would be pushed to call that a jazz album, but there's some beautiful, um, if you actually listen to it, once you get past Rocket, there's some lovely sort of R&B tunes on there, pop tunes on there, some, and there's, there's stuff that, which is, is pretty fusion-y. Um, Herbie Hancock really, with that album, makes the case for 80s fusion. He, he changes the sound, you know, everyone's gonna sort of get in line with that sound after that album. At number three in the chart, so we're, we're to the, the top three now. At number three, we have Weather Report, Heavy Weather. Um, as I said in the video um, before on, on fusion, um, Heavy Weather, so Joe Zawinul, He's one of the greatest jazz pianists of all time. Weather Report come out of sort of the Miles Davis group, Wayne Shorter and Joe Zawinul. They're making really exploratory, spacey jazz, which is really rooted in what Miles was doing in the late 60s. Right, that sound starts to get mixed with sort of dance grooves, 
uh, and and um, dance beats, not disco because we're not at that point, but it starts to get mixed with those types of things. On heavy weather, um, what Weather Report do is they bring in two influences. They bring in disco, all right. So there's disco beats on here, but they also bring in bebop. I make my case for this by the opening track, which is called Birdland, which is really in a homage to um, Charlie Parker, you know, it's, and the club where that was named after him. But the, a lot of the lines seem very beboppy. Jaco Pastorius is um, really makes his name on this album, which um, and he, he 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 makes his name by transferring bebop lines onto bass. The bass is a very clunky instrument, it's difficult to play fluid lines on, and Jacko showed the world how to do that, and he did that by, uh, you know, taking Charlie Parker, you know, style phrasing and put it onto the bass. Um, he does this actually, um, on his solo album, Jacko Pastore, the first track is Donna Lee, where he actually transfers Charlie Parker, um, you know, tune onto the bass, and then solos like Charlie Parker with that sort of bebop phrasing. So to me, those are the two extra elements. It's bebop, the most esoteric form of jazz, the difficult form, and disco put together. Um, and I said on the other video, and I'm gonna say it here, if I was um, talking to Charlie Parker and I wanted to show him the influence he had on music, I would play him heavy weather. I'm sure he'd recognize his sound on that album and how that sound was able to become the third biggest selling jazz album of all time. You know, it's quite an achievement. Um, that album's got some really heavy playing on it. Weather Report, a serious band, they're at the peak of their powers. Um, so anyone who describes this as sort of being middle of the road or easy listening, they haven't listened to it, go and listen to it. And I think, you know, tracks like Havana, they've got some real heavy, fiery playing on it. At number two, we have Herbie Hancock, Headhunters, right? Um, Herbie Hancock um, had a band before Headhunters called Mandashi Band, which again, like Weather Report, was sort of this post Miles Davis, spacey jazz, difficult group. Uh, and I think the story is he did a tour with the Pointer Sisters and he heard the commerciality of the grooves of what the Pointer Sisters were doing and he wanted to bring that into the music. So actually, this album, 1973, was when fusion got funky, All right? Up until then, jazz fusion was a fusion of jazz and rock music, psychedelic and progressive. You know, the Mavish Orchestra, you know, there's no funk in there. They can be funky, but there's no real funk. There's no disco. There's no, you know, you can't dance to the Mavish Orchestra. Herbie Hancock is the guy we have to thank for making jazz fusion funky, right? Why do we have to thank him? Because that kept jazz alive. Right, it made jazz mainstream. It created fusion. The sort of the fusac of the late seventies really is rooted in this album. But the thing about this album is they're still playing as heavy as they did in the Mwamudishi band. I would argue that um, Chameleon, which was a big hit record, right? Once you get past the sort of riffy, dum 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 dum, that goes, and then there's a the track is quite long. And then suddenly it turns around and you get that bit goes do 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 ba do 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 ba ding 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 and it kicks off and then they're playing all over places. It's changes Herbert Hancock's you know and he's he's really bringing the synthesizer in and really giving that a place in music. On side two, there's a track called Sly, and that band just flies. In fact, if you would ask me to give an example of a band flying, it would be Herbie Hancock, Headhunters, Sly. They just fly, and Harvey Mason um, plays the drums, which is somewhere between jazz swing and funk. So many drummers were trying to do this at the time. You know, Jock John was doing it in his way in the Miles Davis group, right? Cobham's trying to do it on his way, and he does it to some extent on um, Spectrum. All, all these albums are coming out at the same time. I can remember working with a, a jazz musician called Chris Bowden, and he said, I need to find a drummer that can play halfway between that straight funk beat and jazz swing, you know, and that is what Harvey Mason does on that track Sly. Massively influential on me. 
in terms of the way I play jazz. This is one of the most important albums in jazz history. It's at number two, it's an important album. I don't think any of the fusion albums in this chart are the easy listing Fusac albums. I think every single one is of a high merit. It really makes the case that jazz fusion is one of the most important music forms in jazz and should get the credits it deserves. But at number one, we have, with four million copies sold, Kind of Blue by Miles Davis. Right, which is incredible because Kind of Blue could well be also in the top of the charts of the most important innovative albums in jazz history. Um, Miles Davis' achievement on this album is simply sublime. He breaks new ground. He, 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 he changes the sound of jazz. He changes the way jazz musicians are going to solo. He introduces modal concepts. He redefines the blues. But he does it in a way which is so accessible that more people have bought this album than any other jazz album in history. Right. I'm not going to say that much more. You know, I, there's a video I've done on Miles Davis where I look at, you know, his, his electric albums of the 70s and his uh, 80s fusion albums. But in terms of his importance in music, this is the album, Kind of Blue is his peak. Um, it... it it um, brings Bill Evans to the stage, who is one of the greatest musicians of all time. It brings John Coltrane to the stage, which is one of the greatest musicians of all time. It brings Paul Chambers to the stage, who's one of the great bass players of all time. It does so much. It is such an innovative album uh, that um, it's incredible that this is at number one, where you would really expect there to be something which is just out and out commercial, you know, that is just like pandered to the listing audience but no this is a it's a heavy album um none of these albums can compete with the biggest selling rock albums of all time you know if you look at a led zeppelin or beatles their big albums could have sold 30 or 40 50 50 million albums i think what's thriller sold 60 70 million albums which is 10 times the amount of the biggest selling album on here right but it shows it, it makes the case that um Commerciality is an important way of looking at music because when we look at this list, we actually can see in the in the era of albums, right? So we're not getting the swing era bands covered that much. We're not even getting the bebop, you know, not that they sold any records. But from the 1950s on, we really do see the important movements of jazz represented in this list. That I think that's really interesting because it makes the case that I've been making on these videos recently that um, that commerciality was really important in the development of jazz and the history of jazz. So there we have the top 35 jazz albums of all time. I hope you enjoyed this. It's been a long video. I think it's been an hour. We're just coming up to an hour long. So it's been a long video. So I hope you enjoy it and uh, the next video I'm going to be is discussing 80s jazz and pitting the traditional ism of Winter Marsalis against the open to everything um, ness of Pat Metheny. So I hope you're looking forward to that and I'll see you soon. Thank you very much.